Jesus, and that is really our refrain for these next few weeks, really anticipating and expecting the arrival of Jesus, and we know that he came the first time and he's coming again, and so we're going to be celebrating and remembering these things. I'm going to invite Nathan to come on down. We're going to light our second Advent candle, and as many of you know, we have four Sundays in preparation and anticipation of Christmas, and so each Sunday we're going to light an Advent candle, and uh, consider the, the light that is shining is just revelation of, of who Jesus is, the light of the world. Mm -hmm. And so last week we looked at hope that we have, a, an assurance through Christ, and today Nathan's going to be sharing um, the peace we have through Jesus. All right. Thanks, Pastor. And so a verse I just wanted to read here that, um, that pertains to this, uh, this topic of peace that we have because of Jesus is Colossians 3, uh, verses 15. And 16, and it instructs to let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. And verse, verse 16 continues to say, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs <coughs> with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Just wanted to touch on this verse because some of the few fruits of the Spirit that I ever felt after I got saved for peace and joy, and I couldn't explain why, because nothing um, external was happening in my life to make these things uh, appear in me, and it was just because of the presence of Jesus, and the Bible answered that. In verse 16, like it says right here, I'm about to sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, so let's, uh, let's proceed to do so. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Good morning, everyone. We enjoy doing the Christmas songs. We have this one month to really do that. And how many enjoy hearing when you go in stores and places and songs about Jesus? It's pretty awesome. Of course, a lot of people they just they go on by they don't know what's even being sung. But but we know uh, through Jesus Christ and relationship with Him, and uh, it's wonderful to get to experience that just being out and about. Uh, well, a few quick announcements for you today. Um, First thing is regarding our candlelight service on Christmas Eve, and just want to uh, you take note, mark that in your calendar. It's where we're going to circle and, and have the candlelights and, and silent night, and we're also going to tell the story of Jesus Christ and who he is and why he came. And so if you know someone who maybe doesn't know Jesus or um, just someone that you think would really benefit from that kind of service, then please invite them. This is a really a great opportunity to reach out to neighbors or coworkers or just someone that you may know, a friend, that can come and be a part of that. So we would love to have really a full, a full church for that Sunday. We'd uh, really encourage you guys to do what you can to invite people. It'll be Christmas Eve at 7.30. And I think that's about it. Are there any other announcements then? Sonia. Um, ladies, we're not going to have a Christmas party at the church this year, but we're going to get together Thursday night um, at 6 o'clock. If we can meet here, we're probably going to go to supper somewhere. So um, any of you that can come, if you want to bring a $5 gift, we'll exchange gifts at Christmas. And just have a fun time. Thursday night at 6 o'clock, yes. So they should meet here then? Yeah, meet at the this church Thursday. here, and then we'll go together. Okay, this Thursday at 6 o'clock. Thank you. Ladies only. Yeah. Yes. Uh, also, oh, I forgot to mention, today is our fellowship meal downstairs after service. So I invite you to stick around afterward. We'll continue our time of fellowship and just connecting together. A whole meal is down there and ready for you. And so I uh, encourage you all to come and, and avail yourself of that opportunity. Amen? Amen. All right. Good. You got to eat, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, today is... Special Sunday because we are going to be taking in new members today, and I want to share with you about uh, a little bit about church membership and that process. It's really the culmination of the Great Commission, and you know the Great Commission is to go and to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded, and lo, I am with you always to the end of the age. The we know that we are to go and to make disciples. Well, being a disciple, if you're a follower of Jesus, that's not an individual thing, but it's a community thing. And one of the things that we see biblically when you get saved, that you get saved into a family. This is why the Bible often talks about the household of God. And so you know that language, God's our father, that we're brothers and sisters. Uh, the household of God is, is all through the Bible there. Also looking at the church being a body with many parts, and we're each a different part of the body, but we're to be working together knit together in love, really, for the unity, in unity that we may glorify God in, in uh, how we live. And so we also see uh, the church as a body, as a household, and just these really great uh, pictures. The other one's a building that's built up together, living stones, and we're each chiseled out by the master craftsmen, fit together perfectly. Uh, each one of us has a part and a role in this body and in the, in the larger church as well. So we want to recognize the seven people that God has uh, put in their hearts to commit to membership and to just publicly identify that this is where God has me and I belong here. This is where I want to serve and to be involved. And so we're really excited for that. I'm going to ask if the seven of you who have, uh, are ready to become members, if you guys would come on up at this time. And then if we can have our elders and deacons come up as well.
Isn't this a good looking crew up here? <laughs> so uh, we are so blessed, really, and uh, having seven people come on and that have been involved and are serving in our church, and uh, it's been really exciting, really, as church leaders to to know that these seven have really identified and, and just uh, sense God's calling to, to be here and to serve, and uh, we're just so blessed, really, when we consider uh, how richly God has blessed us with family and being able to know and to serve alongside one another. And so the covenant, um, what we're looking at was really a church covenant, and a covenant is really an agreement between two parties. Who's married here today? You're in a covenant, right? And a covenant expresses responsibilities and obligations of each party. And when we look at a marriage covenant, that is an that is a unconditional covenant. It means that I will do these things regardless of what you do. That I will be faithful, I will be loving, uh, all those things. And so when we look at a membership of what it means to be part of a church, God has responsibilities and obligations that are found in the scriptures for members of the church and how they are and how you are to live, how we are to live, I should say even, and then also for leadership and elders and deacons and, and criteria that God has assigned to them and our responsibilities and obligations that we have to you. And so everything that we're going to discuss here in a moment is just simply found in the Bible. We're not making up anything. We're just actually expressing what the Bible already teaches. We're acknowledging that in a public way. And so we're going to, uh, to go ahead and go through that. Before we do, let's pray. We just want to ask for God's blessing on on our ceremony here. So let's pray. Our Father, we just are so grateful to be able to worship you this morning, to come together as brothers and sisters, and, and just to uh, proclaim that, that you are great, that you are good, that you are worthy of all of our praise. And Lord, when we consider uh, what we're about to do, it's just a reminder, Lord, of that precious gift of salvation, Lord, that you have given through Jesus, your Son. That you have chosen us, Lord, adopted us into your family by, by grace, Lord. We know it's the gift of God. And Lord, as we know that you have adopted us into your family, Lord, you have not left us alone, but that you have called us into a local assembly, a church, Lord, that we can belong and, and love others and be loved by others as well. So Lord, I thank you for those that are standing here today and um, those who are committing to just expressing that, that um willingness to, to identify with this local church, and also those who are standing behind, Lord, who you have called and raised up in positions of leadership and responsibility. Lord, we know that each one that is in this building today here that, that knows you, Jesus, that you have called us to be faithful in the things that you have for us. Lord, we know that we are, we are not perfect, Lord, but you have called us to be faithful and to know and to love and to grow in a relationship with the one who is perfect with you. So Lord, we pray that as, as these uh, statements are being read and the scriptures are being considered, that we would do so with humble hearts, knowing that we can do nothing apart from the grace of God. Uh, everything that, that we can that we could find uh, reason to, to, uh, to celebrate, Lord, we know that is, is a gift from you. So Lord, let us be mindful of that. And we pray, Lord, that this would be a blessing to each one that is here, and also to the congregation, Lord, as we rejoice and celebrate what you are doing in, in, our, con in our midst. So we pray that it would be meaningful to you and, all, and, and to one another, and ultimately that it would be glorifying and, uh, to your name. And so we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <laughs> okay, so we are going to go through... Um, Beginning here, just personal statements of faith. Uh, one thing that, that I'm most diligent on is, to the best of my ability, is, is to make sure that, that those who are becoming members of this church are members of the church, which is really what matters, because being a member of God's church is what enables us to go to heaven. And so being a member of this church is not a ticket to heaven, and we want to make sure that everyone's clear on that. It's only through a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so the first thing and most important thing in church membership is to make sure that we're a member of God's church. 
And so they're going to express these commitments of faith uh, in unison together. And so you'll join me here. I am a Christian, saved from the eternal wrath of God, by faith in Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, through his death and resurrection, by which I am assured of eternal life. I have repented of my sins and made a new creation in Christ. I have baptized to personally identify with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And uh, thank you. Uh, we know that um, the personal statement of faith includes uh, salvation, repentance, and although not necessary for salvation, each one here has has been uh, baptized by uh, immersion in water, and they are ex expressing that here today to identify with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Our next item that we're going to look at is the statement of doctrine. And our church has doctrinal statements that we look at, uh, who we believe, or what we believe, and uh, each one has, has considered the doctrines and is, you will express your agreement with our church doctrines. I agree. I agree, I agree with, with the four beliefs of the Emmanuel Evangelical, Evangelical Church, church which, which express our church doctrines. Church doctrines. And just as uh, membership, those who are members have um, expressing these things, we also now want to express as leaders our obligations and responsibility that we have to you and to all of you as well. And so uh, this should give uh, assurance and confidence that, uh, that we, are, we are taking seriously the roles that Jesus has put in our lives and we'll do the best that we can by the grace of God for his glory. We covenant that your elders and deacons will meet the criteria of signs of them in the scriptures. We covenant to seek God's will for our church to the best of our ability as we study the scriptures and follow the Holy Spirit. We covenant to provide teaching and counsel from the scriptures. We covenant to care for you to seek your girl as a disciple of Jesus Christ by helping to equip you for service and praying for you regularly. We covenant to exercise church discipline when necessary. And these are all back to biblically our obligations that we have uh, to the church membership here, given by God. And now it's your turn, knowing as we have expressed our obligations to you, uh, what your obligations are as a church member. Would you read together? I understand the importance of submission to church leadership and will be diligent to preserve unity and peace. I will maintain a close relationship with Jesus Christ through regular Bible reading, prayer, and fellowship. I will be a faithful steward of all of what God has given me, including my time, talents, and treasure. I agree by God's grace to walk in holiness as an act of worship to Jesus Christ. I will refrain from sinful behavior as the Bible, my church leaders, and my conscience dictate. Should I sin, I agree to confess my sins and seek to put my sin to death. Amen. Amen. Let's thank the Lord for this. sheets here that I understand that this covenant can only be kept with God's help. Mm -hmm. Any ability I have to fulfill this covenant is the work of the Holy Spirit in my life. This means that I can do all things through Jesus Christ my Lord, and that I should have no reason to be proud of spiritual success. I understand this covenant and accept the responsibility to live as a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ to his glory. Amen. Amen. Like if the elders and deacons would do with their hands and we want to pray over these guys here. And congregation, if you would extend a hand out to our brothers and sisters up front. And if you, um, if we have a few of you pray as we let, and then I'll focus.
Father, we thank you for the Holy Spirit rest upon each of these hearts. We thank you for the unity that they are entering into with us. And we thank you that we are merely a foretaste of your great togetherness and, and your eternal life. And we thank you that your will might be done through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, in each one of their hearts and lives. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity through your Holy Spirit to welcome these new members into our congregation. Mm -hmm. Be with them, watch over them, and bless them, Lord. And help us to lift them up and help them when there's a need, Lord. Mm -hmm. In your name. Father, you've called each of these children to be your own. And we thank you today that we can celebrate with them as they have committed to serving here in this body of Christ. And we just give you the praise, Lord, because we know that you work in each one of our hearts, Father. And I pray that today you will continue as they've given this commitment today, Lord, that you will just anoint them where you see that your will is in their life and they need a special touch each time. We just thank you and praise you for this and for each one of them. In Jesus' name. Uh, Father, we thank you so much. Uh, just celebrate your goodness, Lord, your saving grace, and Lord, your empowering grace to help us to live out your will for our lives. Uh, we thank you for the things that have been expressed, and we pray that your Holy Spirit, Lord, would guide and direct us each day that we may be faithful in the things that you call us to. Uh, we pray knowing that, uh, that all these things are, are just by your grace, Lord, and so, Lord, we, we rest in that today. Uh, we pray that uh, those who are in the pews as well would be reminded of, of their callings and their purposes as well, uh, knowing, Lord, that you call each one of us to humbly surrender before you and to fulfill uh, the, the good works that you have prepared in advance for us to do. Uh, we ask for your blessing on each one here as we do this in community together. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Uh, one more last thing here. You guys, as members of the congregation, do you agree to do everything within your power to love and to serve and to bless those that are up here as God enables you? Will you express your agreement to that by saying, we will? We will. All right. <laughs> Time we're going to have our Bible reader come forward, and Nate, you have the word for us today. And we're going to be reading from Luke's Gospel, it's chapter 1, verses 39 to 45. So Luke chapter 1, 39 through 45. If you're using the Black Pew, Pew Bibles, it's on page 856. So let's stand. And as you have the word, uh, get that ready, and we'll follow on at Nathan's. And uh, before you start reading, Nate, uh, anyone who needs to go down for nursery, head on down. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me, that, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in the womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed 
that, that, that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Hands are raised. So you may be seated. Yesterday, a couple of people noticed that I don't have any Christmas decorations. Uh, I have a couple, but all the rest of them are at Matt's house. Um, and she said, well, when are you going to get in the spirit? And I thought, wow, I am in the spirit. Not, not just in the spirit as a Christian, but Christmas decorations are, gives me less and less to me every year. And God, what God did for us means more and more. And I knew I couldn't make her understand that because for them it was all about the decorations, but anyway, that was, that was a good reminder for me of how grateful I am for Lord and Savior. Let us pray. Silent night, holy night. Lord, we come before you with grateful hearts for all that you do for us, that all that you give us, that all that you are to us. Father, I thank you especially for my precious, precious family. Lord, right now I want to lift up Yara's father to you, who is um, struggling with diabetes in Thailand. I pray that you lay your healing hand upon him. And I pray that you would comfort her as she is here in our country and not with him. Lord, I do pray for our country. I pray for our leaders, both national and state and local. I pray for our city, Father. I am grateful to live here, and I just pray a blessing over this town. Lord, I pray for those who are lonely, those who don't know you, Lord, those who do know you but can't reach out or can't make it to church. Be with them and comfort them. Lord, I pray for missionaries, especially the missionaries in Chile that my kids were involved with. I pray that you provide the needs of everyone involved. Lord, I pray for the sick, the lonely, the lost, and the searching. Give them comfort and guidance. Lord, you promise a faithfulness. You promise that your mercies are new each morning. I pray that through this holiday season, through this Christmas season, we will rest in that assurance. Amen. Amen. Last week we finished up Genesis. And if you remember, we looked at Genesis 50 and culmination of all of that we have really studied and learned and grown in over the whole year of 2018. So uh, we are now free to do some of these Christmas passages. And so today we find ourselves in Luke's Gospel. And so uh, go ahead and find your place right there, Luke chapter 1. We're going to be going through, today we're looking at really two women. And both are marginalized. One is young and single, and the other one is old and barren. And each of these women has a miraculous birth. Remember Elizabeth, his husband is Zechariah. They're old, barren, not able to have children. Gabriel comes and says that you will have a son. He says this to Zechariah and says that you're to name him John. And John means God is gracious. We have a John here, don't we? God is gracious. Uh, and it, the angel Gabriel also came to Mary. You're familiar with this story, I'm sure. It says that you will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, uh, meaning that he saves us from our sin. He is our Savior. And this was really a fulfillment of prophecy. If you remember all the way back from Isaiah's, God, Isaiah's uh, uh, book there in Isaiah 7, it talks about uh, the prophecy that a virgin will give birth. How will you know that it's the Messiah, that it's the chosen one, that the one who will save us from our sins? That he will be born of a virgin. And so 700 years before Jesus came, it was prophesied that that would be the sign that would be given. And here you have Mary, who's 
really a marginalized, obscure, poor, rural girl, really a girl, probably a, a teenager, maybe 15 or 16 years old, and she is the one who is chosen to, uh, to have this great, this great honor here. And so today we're going to look at really Mary and Elizabeth and how they're going down a road that they've never been down before. How many of you have been in a situation where you'd say, this has never happened to me before? Or maybe you're in a situation like that right now. I've never had to face the things that I'm facing right now. Or I'm going through something that is, is new territory. It's uncertain what the future looks like. And sometimes we end up in those places where we're just not sure how it's all going to work out. There's uncertainty, maybe with marriage and family and finances, or just health. Or there's things in our lives sometimes that are just, it's uncertain how it's all going to end up. And we see that, well, that we are on a, a path or a road that, that we don't know how it's all going to work out. I want to share with you that, that if God puts you on a path, that, that he will help you in the challenges that you have. And his word even says that, that lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the age. And God had put Mary and Elizabeth on this incredible path that they really didn't know how everything was going to turn out, but they trusted in God. And they said, I know that you put me on this path, that I'm right where you want me to be, and I'm going to, I'm going to go on in, in faith. And this is an, an incredible situation that they both find themselves in. And maybe you're finding yourself in a situation that you need some assurances from the Lord and His Word today. And so that's what I want to share with you today. How do you know that it's from God? I want to give you just kind of seven kind of quick ways that you can think about the situation that you're in, what's going on in your life. How do you know that it's from God and what He's calling us to do? First thing is that everyone says that it can't be done. Sometimes that's a, cue, a clue. Okay, maybe that this is something that God is doing in our life. Number two, you feel that you aren't qualified. Sometimes God is calling us to things, and our initial response is, well, I'm not qualified for that. And that may be a clue that, that this is something from the Lord. Number three, there aren't enough resources available. Say, well, how's that going to work? We just don't know how that's going to work. Not enough resources. Well, God owns the cattle on a thousand hills, right? He has all the resources. He may be putting you in a situation where he, wa where he wants you to trust him to a greater degree. Number four, it makes no rational sense. How many have been in a situation where I know that this is God's leading, but it really just doesn't make any rational sense? Have you been in those kind of situations? Uh, that may be from the Lord. Number five, people will call it or you stupid. <laughs> you ever been in a situation where people are thinking, no, that's not a good idea. And, uh, and obviously, the Bible says that there's wisdom in a multitude of counselors. We want to consider counselors. But we also know that, um, that there are things that God may call us to that, that other people may be critical of and not, and will say that, that well, that, you know, that, that's, not a good, that's not a good thing to do. Number six, it will give God all the glory. If it's something that is for your glory, then it's probably not something that God has planned for you, right? But if it's something where God is going to get the glory, then we know then that, that that is a clue then that it's, that it's something that God is putting in your life. And number seven, it honors God and is true to His Word. That's important, isn't it? Sometimes people think, well, maybe God's leading me to do this and that, and there's crazy, sinful, foolish things, right? Say, well, is it something that honors God and is it true to his word? Those are things that we want to consider. We're looking at uh, being in a place or a position, something that's uncertain in life. Maybe that God is calling us to go down this road that we have not been on before. So take a look in your scriptures, verse 39 of Luke chapter 1. It says, In those days Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And so, uh, what we see here, remember just remember the background there, the angel that come to, uh, came to Mary and to Elizabeth, and one of the things that the angel said to Mary, Mary is that, and your, your relative, Elizabeth, is also pregnant. And Elizabeth was, was a few months ahead of her, and so Mary is, uh, 
is, uh, is getting this news, and she's going with haste to Elizabeth. Now, sometimes we read very quickly in the scriptures, and we don't understand geography and everything that's going on. There's a, always a lot of depth when you start studying the Word of God and things that, that we may just kind of gloss over. But Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country. This was a, a trek of maybe 100 miles in possibly 100 degree heat, going alone as a teenage girl, dangerous, all by herself out there, pregnant, right? All these things. This was a challenging trip, isn't it? I don't know, Rachel, would you be up for this kind of trip? I don't <laughs> imagine you would. Unless you knew that, that this was very important. And what I want to share with you here, my first point really is, when God is doing something in your life, when he's speaking to you and he's leading you in a certain direction, the first thing of importance is really to get in the right community. And this is something that Mary understood. Hey, I'm pregnant. Elizabeth is pregnant. We're both like miracle birth situations. God's doing something amazing in our lives. I want to get with Elizabeth. Why? Because we have a lot in common here. We both are needing to trust God in, in phenomenal ways. We're both pregnant, so we want to share in the joy. And Mary's thinking, I probably need that mentorship and, and that counsel from Elizabeth, who's my older relative. And so Mary goes, and the word there says, with haste. And this is, I think, really important, too. Uh, going to a man or a woman of God right away. Sometimes God may speak to us, and I think of, of different times in my life where God has spoken something to me. The next person that you go to is really important. Because sometimes what happens is God may speak to you something, and you go to someone who's not a man or a woman of God, and they give you bad counsel. And they may even discourage you or dissuade you from doing the things that God actually has spoken to you that you're to be doing. And so it's so important of who you go to next. You go to the wrong person, it can actually, they can actually sabotage what God is doing in your life. And so Mary's thinking, I know a godly woman, and I'm going to go with haste, and with, even with all of these obstacles in the way, that getting in community and having the right people to be with right now is that important. And maybe some of you have been in situations where there's something going on, it's uncertain, you, just, you, need, you need a godly person in your life. You say, there's lots of people that you can go to, but who are the people of faith? A man or a woman of God? That's who you want to be with in those times, isn't it? And you want to do whatever you can to get a hold of them and to be with them. And those are the exact kind of people that you need to be with. Aren't you glad that we get to be part of a church? I'm thinking of a membership Sunday, and it's, it's so awesome having seven people come on and we're, we're so blessed by each of the seven that were up here, really. Um, you guys add just so much uh, blessing and, and fellowship in our church and the way that each of you is serving and connecting. and it, it's, it's wonderful. It really is. And one of the great things about being a Christian is that we get to be a, a ch in a church, and not just a church, but really a church as a family. And I think that's one of the real strengths of this church, is it really is a family. I had heard something uh, recently in Japan where you can actually rent a family. <laughs> <laughs> if you need a, a groom, you can rent one. And they will fill that role for that day, and then evidently go home. Uh, one of the most popular uh, people, family members you can rent is a boyfriend. And so, um, girls who are going to family dinners and everyone's saying, well, you know, when are you going to get married or something? Well, they can rent a boyfriend. They come to the dinner and everyone's, all the relatives are pleased and then they send them home. <laughs> and and that's, that's that. Uh, you can even rent a baby. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, if someone's, uh, and this, this has happened too, they'll rent a baby. Maybe if someone's uh, about to pass away and, and the people are pregnant and, an older relative, and well, they'll rent a baby and say, here's, here's the baby, and then, it's crazy, it's crazy. Well, 
It's going on in Japan, but be, be uh, aware, it's actually coming here to America soon, too. And there's, there's so much brokenness in our relationships and our families um, that people are resigned to rent people and families. Isn't that, isn't that a sign of, of the times, isn't it? A sign of our culture. Uh, we get to be in a family. No, we don't need to rent anybody, right? Uh, we, have, we have people that, that we know and love and that we're in fellowship with. Find people who know God. That's, that's, when you're going through something, find that kind of person. Mary rose with haste, went to the hill country, town of Judah, entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And watch this in verse 41. When Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And so here we see the Holy Spirit is active in this whole situation. Elizabeth prophesies, these mothers are coming together. Blessed, um, she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Children are a blessing, are they not? And especially this child is, would be the greatest blessing to, that the world has ever known. And verse 43 then says, Why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? And we think of this, uh, it's really an incredible thing of what God is doing. How did she know? How does she know to call Jesus Lord? And I think this is something uh, worthy of looking at here, that the mother of my Lord should come to me. I'll share with you, when God is doing something new in your life, the first thing is to get in community, make sure that you're with the right people. The second thing is to remember who is Lord. How did Elizabeth know this? It's through the Holy Spirit, isn't it? If you think about it, if someone just came in and, you know, how, how would they know that that is the promised one? Well, the Holy Spirit had revealed that to her. The Holy Spirit is active in the midst of these two godly women who are given these miraculous pregnancies. And Elizabeth then becomes the first person to call Jesus Lord. Isn't that cool? Just even as a baby in the womb, uh, he is the Savior, he's Emmanuel, he is God with us, he is Lord. And we think, then, what is she doing by, do, by saying this? She's really worshiping Jesus, even in the womb. Isn't that amazing? It's so cool to think about that, that he is Lord. And we know then uh, that the Bible says that, that without the Holy Spirit, nobody can call Jesus Lord. The scriptures say that. But we also know that in Matthew's Gospel, it says... That not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And so it's not just saying it, but it's actually that Jesus is your Lord. And, and Lord and your Savior. That means that he is God, that you belong to him. And when we think, okay, when life is uncertain, sometimes we make other things Lord. And we can put them in the place of Jesus. We say, well, now the thing that I'm most concerned about or most devoted to or giving the most attention in my life is maybe worry or my reputation or finances or wealth or family or health or comfort or all these things. Are all those things that could have been things that could have risen to the top of, of Elizabeth and Mary's attention and focus? Absolutely. You look at family, you know, Mary doesn't know what's going to go on with Joseph yet and what's happening there. You look at um, reputation, which Mary's reputation was, was significantly tarnished after this time. We look at finances. They're, Mary and, and Joseph are, are poor. How are they going to provide for the Son of God? And it's this incredible thing. All these things that they would have that are uncertain in their life. And Elizabeth declares that with all these things going on and all this... Um, that, is, that is unknown, that the baby in your womb is my Lord. Isn't that a powerful statement? The, the baby, that the, what we look at, the baby in the manger, he's not just the baby in the manger, he is Lord. Is he your Lord? 
And not just, but not just something you say, and we want to be, not, not to be too quick on this. Because there's people out there, maybe even in here, that are very quick to say, oh, Jesus is Lord, but is he really your Lord? Because the Bible says that many will say, Lord, Lord. But how is it that Jesus is your Lord? Because he says, but I never knew them. Do you know Jesus? Not just know of him, but do you really know him? When you know him, he's your Lord. Amen? Amen. It's true. You can't know him and him not be your Lord. But if you don't live for him, then he's not your Lord. Because the Bible says that Jesus says, they're not doing the will of my Father. And so it, gives, it gives testimony or evidence that we do belong to him. The baby in your womb is my Lord. The baby is our Lord. He doesn't stay a baby, by the way. But we do remember him that way at this time. So, if you're going through something in life, we reflect on the blessing of community, getting with godly people. Jesus is, is your Lord through everything. All the uncertainties, the hardships, everything that you're feeling and facing. He is Lord, and that changes everything. And Elizabeth, at this point, she's saying it by faith. Because she has not seen him live yet. She hasn't even seen him yet. He hasn't walked on water. He hasn't healed anybody. He hasn't cast, it out, cast out any demons. He hasn't raised anybody from the dead. He hasn't died. He hasn't been crucified. He wasn't buried. He did not resurrect yet. Is he Lord? Already. He's already Lord. What does John do? We know what Elizabeth and uh, Mary are doing. We know what... Um, but what are John, what is John doing at this time? What do you notice in the scriptures here? Verse uh, 40, 44. For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. So that's what John's doing. Isn't this a great scene? You have Elizabeth, he's my Lord. Mary, I just need to be with a godly person. John's like, hey, I'm, I'm excited to be here too. <laughs> Leaping for joy. The Holy Spirit is active in, in all these godly people and God himself right there in the midst. And it's, it's just an empower, a powerful scene. And uh, Elizabeth is, is feeling this. John leaping for joy. I remember watching ultrasounds of Charlotte and, and both Char Charlotte and Sophia. Some of you uh, parents with younger children have ultrasound memories. Some of you don't, because the ultrasounds weren't invented at that time. But I do remember uh, Charlotte and Sophia. I remember Charlotte chewing on the umbilical cord. <laughs> that's not a good idea. I don't know. That seems really dangerous, doesn't it? But I guess they don't have maybe all their teeth, and so it's not, maybe not a worry. But I was actually a little bit nervous about that. Like, don't chew that off. You need that. <laughs> <laughs> Sophia was doing flips, you know, she's so active, she's flipping around and doing all these things, and I was so excited, I'm like, did you see that, Tanya? And she's like, see it, I felt it, I'm like, I feel all this. Well, Elizabeth did too, and she's, she's feeling her baby John is leaping for joy in that. What a, what a wonderful scene here, you have the two babies, John, who's really the last one of the Old Covenant, the forerunner, the one who has prophesied, who would prepare, the one who would prepare the way for the Lord to come. And you have Jesus, who is God in the flesh, Emmanuel, the one who is coming, who John said, I'm not even worthy to tie his shoes. And here we have this meeting of them as babies in the womb. And, and John is worshiping. He has the right response. He's filled with the Holy Spirit, and he's worshiping as an as a unborn baby in the womb, worshiping God as an unborn baby in the womb. What a tremendous and amazing thing. And then look at verse 45. And blessed is, and this is what Mary or Elizabeth is saying, and blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And we know then this final word of Elizabeth's prophecy really is that Mary would be blessed for her faith. And as Jesus came on this this rescue mission. He's our Savior. He's our Lord. We know He atones for the sins of the world on the cross. He makes enemies His friends and idolaters into sons and daughters through adoption. 
And this is the testimony of everyone who is saved here today, isn't it? That that is your testimony. And he speaks today. What I want to ask you in closing here is really what is our response? And we see John is, is filled with the Holy Spirit. He's worshiping. Elizabeth is, is prophesying. And, and she's recognizing Jesus as her Lord. Mary is just being humble and obedient. I want to be with godly people. I, I, need, I need godly people from, with all the uncertainties in my life. What is going to be our response? And we're looking at this. And Zena, the things that you shared. You know, what is really important at, at this time of year, but any time of the year, right? What is the most important thing? You may say, well, you know, Pastor Amon, there's uncertain things in my life. I'm on a new road. I don't know exactly how things are going to end up with, with the things going on in my family life or my finances or career or marriage or all these things. Well, look at the things going on here. And look at the responses. And we see then that what, what does God want us to do? Well, the first thing is that we need to make sure that we're on the journey, right? That we're starting on, that we've started on the journey. And this is what the Bible calls to be born again. Because you cannot be on this whole journey and following the will of God and knowing Him and loving Him and Him being your Lord and in, in community with other believers unless you know that you are born again. Because the Bible says, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And so that is the main thing. Have you even started the journey? And how do you start? The Bible says that we are to repent of our sins. That we are to put our full trust in the Lord Jesus. He is Lord. As a baby in the womb, He is Lord. Now He is risen from the dead and He is reigning on high. Is He Lord now? Absolutely. He is Lord then and He's Lord now. And the Bible says that there will be a day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so our choice is, are we going to do that willingly now out of a humble response to the great love that God is offering through Jesus, His Son? Or will we be forced to later? And we know then that, that God is wanting us to willingly come before Him in repentance and faith, trusting in who He is. And then it begins this journey, doesn't it, of walking with Jesus each day. And we know then that that um, the assurance that we have is that he goes with you through everything. Sometimes we, we think of that sometimes we're, we're all alone. But find a godly person, remember that he is Lord, and remember then that he goes with you all the way. I want to close with this poem by George MacDonald. It's a little bit old in language, but it's really rich. Uh, and if we can have our worship team come on up here, you guys. Thank you. So, this is a poem by George MacDonald. He said, it's kind of a conversation between him and God. And he said, I said, let me walk in the field. And God said, nay, walk in the town. I said, there are no flowers there. He said, no flowers, but a crown. I said, but the sky is black and there's nothing but noise and din. But he wept for me as he sent me back. There is more, he said. There is sin. I said, but the air is thick and the fogs are, are veiling the sun. He answered, yet souls are sick and souls in the dark undone. I said, I shall miss the light and friends will miss me, they say. He answered me, choose tonight if I am to miss you or they. I pleaded for time to be given. He said, Is it hard to decide? It will not seem hard in heaven to have followed the steps of your guide. I cast one look at the fields, then set my face to the town. He said, My child, do you yield? Will you leave the flowers for a crown? Then into his hand went mine, and into my heart came he, and I walked in a light divine, the path I had feared to see. <laughs> Is that the path that you're on today? It requires really trusting in him. You may say, well, it seems so light where I am, and it's so dark where he is, but it's really the opposite, isn't it? 
It's, it's darkness and sin, and it's light when God is your guide. And he leads us in the way that we should go. So, Father, I just uh, pray for, for all of us here today, uh, myself included, Lord. And we know that, that you call us to come unto you. Uh, all who are weary and heavy laden, you will give us rest for our souls. And we know that's an invitation to know you in a saving way. And Lord, we need to be saved because we are born in sin, separated from you, spiritually dead. And I pray here that, that no one would leave without, without considering <coughs> Jesus. Lord, we know that, that Jesus came uh, not just to be born as a baby, but to live without sin and to die in our place for our sin. Uh, a gift, Lord, that has been given, the greatest gift for our greatest need, a Savior. And we thank you, Lord, for that. We pray that when we see Jesus in the, in the manger, that we would be reminded that, that he is our Lord, that he is our Savior. I pray that each one here would, would submit to that, would put our trust in you with with uncertainties and questions, Lord, we know that we are to simply put, put our hand in yours and trust that you are the one that holds the words of everlasting life and that we will give our lives to none other but to you. We thank you, Lord, when we come with humble repentance for our sins and submission to you and, and who you are and what you did on our behalf, Lord, that you pour out your mercy in us. Uh, where we are destined for hell, you have given us the gift of of knowing you and heaven and eternal life that comes with that. So, Lord, we rejoice in that today. We pray that each one would, would be on that journey here today. We pray for those that are on that journey already that we would have greater trust in you. Lord, with all the uncertainties in life, your will gives us and your word gives us clear directions for how we are to respond to them. We pray that you would find us faithful in these things, that Mary and Elizabeth and even John as a baby would be examples on our behalf, Lord, and that we would consider Jesus in all these things. Uh, thank you, Lord, for who you are and, and how you have loved us all. We pray that we would reflect on these things, Lord, and that we would ponder these things in our hearts, and that we would let you guide us each step of our days. We ask this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Amen.
before we go down. And so you'll take the hand of the person next to you. I'm going to ask Andrew, would you lead us in a prayer over our food and fellowship time? Sure. Lord, we thank you so much for the service that uh, you provided today, Lord. We thank you for the message that Pastor Mark delivered. We, uh, we so thank you for sending Jesus as a babe for the salvation of our sins. And uh, we remember you today, Lord, and for the rest of the month. And... Uh, we thank you for this food, and we ask for your blessing upon it. We pray for the day that uh, we glorify, glorify and honor you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 We're going to have our new members are going to be first in line. So you guys can head on down. <laughs> Oh, yeah. 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 Oh,